Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Lucid, and Sai has joined me yet again. Hello, I'm Sai, and I've yet again joined Lucid. So, last episode, not a lot of action, but there's probably going to be a lot of action this turn. We've got a war, a new war kicking off between Pythium and Agartha, so that's going to be exciting. Agartha without any foul vapors countermeasures, and Pythium very intent on gassing him. And I think the most interesting thing about the game state is how many free agents there are and how all of the Diplo shakes out. It to me is going to be the most interesting part of the next like three or four turns. Yeah. Between Chi, Erythia, Vettiheim, all just, just a lot of very powerful players that are all free to pick their next war. Right. A message has arrived from Arethia. Now that Atlantis is basically out of the game, the only major threat for me is Joman, but I doubt I can take him out at this time. That's interesting. I think they could probably just mop Joman up. I think he means just border-wise, it would be awkward for him to go over oh, okay. there. On the other hand, there's an anti marignon coalition formed, and it would be a nice opportunity for Arethia to take out Pangea. It'd also be a nice opportunity for Arethia to get the Marinese Lake. Yeah. But I don't know why he, it's yeah, possible I think he this perceives... is two birds with one stone. Because if Pangea yeah, he... let's take a look at if Pangea, because their course of invasion is going to be up this way. So if they take all of this stuff, that would be a great time for Arethia to attack. Take all this. From Pangea, push Pangea out of Marignan, and then take the Marignan stuff for themselves. So it's like can they can that. let Pangea come through, clear the mages out, then attack them. Yeah, I, I also think that part of what he's saying there is just that he thinks Pan is like more threatening. Yeah, which is true, I think. Yeah. There are also rumors that TNG is looking towards Arethian land with not the best intentions. So let's see how it goes. So, oh my goodness. It's just one foul vapors caster. He, he didn't even bother bringing, like he, he could have honestly just completely taken this army on no problem, I think. But he didn't bother, he just gassed them. Yeah. This seems completely irresponsible from Agartha. Yeah. I, I wonder if these guys are on fire questions. I don't, let's, count, let's actually get the grid out real quick. One, two, three, four, five, and so well, this the is thing 10. is that if, 20, the mage is just much further away. 30, 40. This guy might be actually just out of range, too. Because these guys are 40 range. I think this guy's right at, like, 45. But, like, even if they were in range, they would do the calculation on how likely they are to hit him compared to how likely they are to hit these, like, barbarian province defense or Arjun province defense, You're which are also... You're confident in predicting what the targeting AI is going to do. I feel... I forward position shit all the time. I feel like I pick stuff off in the back all the time. But... Yeah, but it really depends on what else is on the field is the thing. Okay, this wasn't even just a foul vapors. He also gym burnt a crazy amount. Look at yes, this. Yes, because I think Agartha was relying on just winning this battle quickly enough with elemental spam. But as I mentioned, I just don't think that's a responsible gambit. This, this guy's got six, six gems. Uh, check out if the vapors caster is geared or if it's just gems. I think it's just gems. I'm guessing it's just gems. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, okay. Just gems. Yeah, I mean, he has the high the high pathing for it, so it makes sense. The fire elemental did yeet him at the end, but there's a very good chance he would have he would have escaped here too. So yeah, he I think uh, nine cave drakes, but most importantly, he kills six mages. And he gem burned at least 20 gems. I also think, though, that if he left a decent cadre of troops behind, he actually just clears that army. Yes. No, they would have had to fight through the elementals, and the elementals would have caused yeah. a decent amount of damage. I think it was worth it to to dodge the fight just to get the elementals out of the way. That's fair. And Agartha did does not gems. have a lot of gem income. Like this, losing 20 gems is a major deal for them. Very true, yeah. So that was here... But here, they ping this province. Oh, here they patrol. So this army didn't move. I don't like that, honestly. I uh, oh, they, I really they think consolidated. That... I think because I think there was an army here and here, and they consolidated yeah. here. 
Because there's this weird river. Like, this army couldn't move here. So it looks like they're going to go from here to here. So there's a very predictable move from Pythium to move the army up this way. This is where the yeah. Foul Vapors trap was. My my thinking, basically, is just that by pulling back like that, Pythium gave up the initiative when they have the advantage in current army composition. Yeah. Like, knowing that they have Foul Vapors and Agartha doesn't have an effective counter to Foul Vapors online, like, they should be trying to take these fights. Yeah. I, or I also don't to like take letting that army get, pet, like, between most of your forces and your capital. Yeah, I mean, I guess on the one hand, it is cut off and without gems, so it's going to be a lot easier to engage with, like, a reinforcing army. Right. Especially because you know for a fact it does not have a Fel Vapors answer in it, and you can cast Fel Vapors very easily. Oh, gosh, the dust to dust and the banishment. Now, most of these guys do not have protection buffs. This guy has bark skin. Not that that's going to matter versus dust to dust. Okay, he's got protection. These guys do have decent hit points, though. Yeah. But this is a major gem. This is a major mage turn investment because we saw when Agartha's research line flattened out, it was because he was summoning these umbrals right here. And of course, they're a yeah. major gem investment as well. They're each. Are they one gem each or two? I think it's, it's, I think it's two each for the big guys, but let me double check real quick. But yeah, the, they're basically facing their counter. Right. Which is dust, dust to dust, dust is, casters. Yeah. It, I mean, that's just the most efficient way to deal with elite undead in general. And these guys absolutely count. Yeah. Even though they're one per square and even though they have life drain, you need to do a lot more in order to get them to survive that. Right. Because this was actually, how many, that three Renatus, which actually isn't even that many, to be honest. Um, yeah, the Serpent Priest, I believe, can also random death, but I don't know if he had it now. Yeah, because that. They, they killed these guys really fast. I think their banishment was also pretty effective. Yeah. It's two gems each, but they get four at a time. Two gems each, but they get four at a time. Okay. Yeah, it's eight gems per cast for four umbrals. Eight gems for four. So this was 20. So it's, five, it's 40, 40 gem gems. And five mage turns. Yeah. So not a ton of mage turns, but wait, where's the serpent priest? Here he is. Yeah, no, he's not. Okay. He is advancing casting. I wonder what he's doing uh, outside of the banishment. Yeah, we see banishment, dust to dust, anime dead banishment. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think why he's also just they're getting cast. killed by the troops, if you really look at it. Yeah. And that makes sense, too. I mean, if you've got zero protection then one out of four of these attacks hitting when you're getting hit by like nine units on the edge there is still going to be definitely enough to chop them down. Right. And you're like, oh, well, I have lifesteal. I'm going to be healing. It's like you're healing for five. And these troops are hitting you when they hit for like 15. And like this, you know, like he got hit by a vine arrow. He's about to be toasted. That wasn't dust to dust. That guy just died to, to melee. So if you look at the kills, the dust to dust were all coming from these guys. So there was three dust to dust kills. Most of these guys died... To, uh, oh, it wasn't 20. It's was only 12. Okay. Okay. But, yeah. More modest. Uh, still a solid win for Pythia. Yeah. So he's killed these guys. I mean, Agartha has just taken so many hits. Okay, so this was the, the last march of, of Midgard. He marches on top of this fort. And then, yeah, because of the mechanic where forts don't count as owned provinces, he's effectively seen by the game as not owning any territory and therefore is kaput. So everyone, if you were rooting for Midgard at any point, take that drink, pour a little bit on the ground. Thor, the god of love and plunder. He's been vanquished, so. Thanks for playing, Kosk. Really enjoyed watching you play, and it sucks getting 2v1. So, was definitely glad to see you take a pound of flesh out of everyone. Yeah, very fun to see that one last army just out there hitting above its weight and constantly causing damage. Yeah. And you you should have taken a, a Garth out with you, and that had nothing to do with your own play. It's just other people let him off the hook. So, well played. Sometimes that's the most you can hope for in a 2v1.
So yeah, I think that covers yes, this war. Agartha has some big decisions to make, though. The only thing I think left to cover is like, what does Agartha do? Does he pull back and recore, or does he say fuck it and keep on raiding? I think if you don't have a way of bringing poison resistance casters to that swamp, which I don't think that they can, there's no point in pulling back because you'll just get caught on your way out anyways. I think right. you starburst with this army and just try to hit like three provinces and try to deal some damage. Because Pythium can put a Foul Vapors caster. He can hit this with a Foul Vapors caster and like a Swarm caster. He can put a Foul Vapors caster here. He can put a Foul Vapors caster here, a Foul Vapors caster here. Like, honestly, you could do, you know, like that famous infographic for Napoleon with the Grand Armée marching into Russia and then like coming back and it's like shows the thickness. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Like that the could be this army man lost. without ever yeah. even fighting it. It could just bleed out on its way back as it rips into foul vapors casters every single province. Yeah, I think that you still want to force that reaction. Like you basically want to keep Pythium honest. And if he does, because like as far as I can tell, this army is essentially dead. Yeah. So the most damage that you can do is by catching him wherever he didn't actually set a suitable trap. Yeah. Because you have enough units to beat province defense pretty easily. And you can even beat a solo foul vapors caster fast enough. So Pythium has to like kind of actually be honest in how he defends his borders here. And if he doesn't bring enough, then you can actually cause a little bit more damage with what I would say is essentially a trapped and dead army. Right. Okay. Although getting Eckhart out would be really good if you could manage it, but that's that's very hard from that position. Yeah, I wonder if so. he's an Astro Mage, right? Like... Yeah, I don't like that he brought this guy, honestly. Oh, he's diseased as well. Maybe that's why he brought him. <laughs> yeah. You can, if you get him enough gems, you can do Power of the Spheres in returning. So that's probably Yeah, you can also twice board him. Yeah. Yeah. But in, for to, to twice board him, he'd need to be in friendly territory because if you cast twice board in enemy territory and then lose that province, it didn't do you any good. <laughs> yeah, the safest thing would be somehow sneak a scout to him with two per, with three pearls to do Power of the Spheres in returning, and then you twice board him when he's home suicide him and then you get to keep him but or a shade mail if you can right. sneak that over to him you do lose the alchemist trait though but yeah better, better than, than losing this pass entirely yeah like the astral earth cross path is very very valuable right do you do you get that with the garth i can't remember because nope. you do get after uh, wait yes you do yes you do you you get that as a random yeah, yeah, yeah. on your um it. yeah it's just a little unreliable and it requires making either your floater crew cap only guys or your bad mages. Yeah. I guess you kind of do want Catonian necromancers at some point anyways, but they're just less RP per gold than the alchemists by just so much because they cost almost 300 gold to recruit. Yeah. So I, I don't know, especially with these Umbrals dying, they were an, a pretty important special forces and they honestly, there's nothing you can do to really protect them from dust to dust. But Dust to Dust didn't do all the work here. It, it's a, kind of a shame seeing him die without more mage support, because in some ways this is the only good answer he has at the moment to Foul Vapors. I would say that his intended answer to Foul Vapors was just the elemental spam. Yeah. But, like, he just lost that, right? Well, it would have made more ended. sense to do elemental spam in an army that was primarily composed of umbrals, and then you have the, the, the mages that cast it retreat. So hopefully they die before they get killed by foul vapors. But the umbrals are keeping HP on the field while you let the elementals do their work. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. And there, there's other similar stuff that you can do with retreating mages, but it requires fighting in your own territory and actually being able to control the engagement. Right. So by pushing in the way that Agartha did, he essentially lost the ability to yeah. fight on his own terms and with easy resupply. I like that he's aggressive, though, so I'm going to give him props here, but I don't think, yeah, it's unclear that he has a, but that's kind of the same thing for Midgard. I, I mean, for, yeah, when he was fighting Midgard, it, he had a plan, but it, it didn't seem super well thought through. It was just like throw a bunch of units at it. And while that sort of worked against Midgard, it's not going to work against people with real magic like Foul Vapors. And I would actually argue that it only worked against Midgard because TNG essentially won that war. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I think that ends at Gartha. Let's come down and take a look at Marignan. And oh my god, how did they get here so fast? Weren't they like just down here? Is there a bridge across that river? No. Oh, oh but I guess they go well, here, they, they... yeah. 
And uh, most of their guys are two map move because the slingers don't have heavy armor. Maybe I missed the turn. Maybe they had already moved up farther last turn. But yeah, I mean, it seems like out, out, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's a 600 person army here. I mean, that is spooky as hell. And maybe it's only 500, but still. You know what the supply situation's like there? Uh, they're probably starving. There's only 480 supply that I can see. Yeah, only thing I could think of is that Gath at least does have some nature mages, so if he's got those in there, he right. can help alleviate that. Yeah. he did, It does look like he pulled the Sayir as well, so... Right, and those guys at least don't take supply. Do they? I thought they do take supply, it's just they don't... Most demons will eat supply, but they won't get... If there's... They don't need to eat. For them, it's like a luxury. So if they, they don't actually starve if they don't have supply. But they will. Uh, that's a Yomi thing. Food. It is? No, that's a Yomi thing. Yeah. Okay. Yomi have gluttony, and demons in general have need not eat. Okay. Huh. Well, what's the tag on Seer that keeps them from eating? Need not eat? Yeah, but need not eat. It, mean... It's a default tag on demons. Right. That's that what that I was means saying. they don't take supply. Yeah, no. For, for, so Yomi is special because their demons have gluttony. Most demons don't. Oh, no. I was thinking it's the case with Lanka. Because I, I was remembering uh, that with Lanka, Lanka. I think Lanka also has some gluttony on the, some of their stuff. Yeah. I know that. Okay. Maybe it, is, uh, maybe it is that way. I just assumed that need not eat meant that you don't have to eat, but you still want to. So they'll eat the food. They just won't starve if they don't have enough. But I could be wrong. I can double check this real quick. But I know that their Pragasa, like the fat guys, have like a massive yeah. supply penalty. Yeah. But I think most of their guys... Actually, let me look through. Yeah, yeah. No, Lanka just has a ton, of, a ton of supply penalty on their guys. Yeah. Well, it's pretty easy to check. You can just fire up a test game and summon a bunch of like storm demons and see if they eat anything. Yeah. So... Marriott has a lot of troops, man. They've got 100 here. They've got 140 here, they've got 170 here, and they've got 110 here. Yeah, it looks like, though, they're splitting up their guys, which might just be for supply purposes. But they moved, so the guys that they moved inland, I don't like, because they can't sail them. And I think that they, they kind of do need to death ball, at least in the yeah, first couple engagements. I think so, in order to, Yeah, in order to actually win a, a key battle. So... I think it's okay to give up that inland fort, but I think you want to be able to defend your coastline with sailing. Well, I think you basically... I mean, right now, the only person... Like, this Pangean army, this is the inland fort you give up, right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree on that. But I don't... I think you have to combine this army here, here and you can sail these guys here, too. So yeah, that's probably I, I what I do, that's is defend forced. this, and then if he goes on top of that, I'm like, okay, we're going to have a fight. Yeah, that seems fair. And uh, that all the enchantresses can also get foul vapors, depending on what they Ooh, randomed. Yeah, which could also be very good for a trap. That would be really good for a trap. If he foul vapors traps at this turn, and then next turn moves the army in, that could be sick. Yeah. The, the only issue though is that he moved a bunch of his guys into that inland province, so they they can no longer sail. Yeah, if he brings all his mages, though, we don't know how much Gath has, but if, if Marignan brings all his mages here, with these three forces combined, I feel like he can probably, he has a good shot at taking the Gath stack if he has useful magic like Blood 1 and Conjuration 5. Yeah, Conjuration 5 for sure means that he can basically pull out his wallet and pay to win a single fight. Yeah. That said, Freezing Mist is also going to be very effective. Yeah. So freezing mist plus mist arrow fend if he has it, although I don't know if he would. Yeah, depending on what his research is, there's a lot of stuff that he can do to beat that Gath army. Uh, the Pangean army is going to be harder, but definitely still doable because if I recall correctly, he doesn't have poison, cold resistance in his bless. So the, the clouds can actually smash Pangea if he has some way to keep his own troops alive. I think this fort's forfeit as well. His god is there. The master enchanter, but still, yeah, I I think yeah, you're I don't right. Know I think what these doing. inland forts are totally forfeit, and he has to play around controlling all these seaside forts until he kills armies, and then once he's killed, like even if he just kills the Gath army, then he can start going inland against Pangea. Yeah, and I I think he can kill either of the two armies, but I think it requires such a heavy mage investment 
that he can't kill both armies simultaneously, oh, yeah. and he needs to keep the stuff together. Right. And that's going to be a way that they these guys, because it's kind of what they did against Micklin, is they like it was like an anaconda, right? They they started putting pressure until he started feeling pinned up, and while he was pinned up, they were picking at his heels, taking all his shit. And then eventually, part of that, though, once he was like super committed, then they like have the big fight. I think that part of that, though, was a matter of research because Panju was waiting on hitting their timings. Right. So they were essentially moving in to take stuff without doing their massive mage commitment until they hit that research spike where they actually, you know, it's it's suddenly worth deploying all those guys. That was part of it. And then the second part was that Micklin let them yeah. do that. Right. Like Micklin didn't hit back and he kept you know, retreating further in. So they just kept marching in and continuing to grab stuff while waiting for the research to win that decisive engagement. So it's kind um, of interesting. So I think that with Napoleon, after he got basically defeated in Russia and they were like pushing into him, he was still winning tons of these like crazy battles where he was wildly outnumbered. But anytime he wasn't personally present at a battle, like his, his subordinates would usually lose it. And the 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 coalition forces had like devised a strategy where they're going to have three major divisions and they're each going to proceed but if they can find out that napoleon is personally present in the army that they're about to engage with they're ordered to stall and then the other two armies will progress and tell napoleon and so napoleon would get on a horse and ride from one army all the way down to another and like switch which army he was in all the time but eventually, like just wherever he wasn't, that army would push forward and make progress and like maybe win a small battle or something. But that's essentially what could happen here. Like Gath moves here, Marignan moves all the stuff here. Gath could be like, okay, I don't feel like fighting all of that. He could put like a gym bait or something, move back. Meanwhile, it just opens the gates for Pangea to like come all down here. And after a few turns of doing that, Marignan will really just be stripped down to the core stuff he can definitely defend, which is just like this. The coastline, yeah. yeah. And that would suck. Then you're like in a, you've already kind of lost the game, you know? Yeah, no, it, it's definitely a good strategy. But that said, we d it looks like Marignan is splitting up his stuff anyways. Right. So we'll get to see. But big things are afoot here. Any sign And then the other thing is MG has a lot of stealth and at least a little bit of flying. Right. So they can actually do a lot of like deep strike stuff into Marignan te territory. Yeah. That's a good point. And because we, we had seen that they had a bunch of Seder in their war against Micklin. So like we knew that those guys are somewhere and we don't see them on the map. So we know that he has something stealthy in right. like a around somewhere on the map. So we can presume that they're going to be doing some raiding. It's very hard to tell what... I think TMG is on the fence for what their next move is. They've kept what looks to be some a modicum of forces here. It doesn't look like they're considering a war with Pangea. It looks like most of their stuff is moving this way. So they're either thinking about... It looks like they're thinking about Arethia, but they might also be thinking about Pythium. Yeah, given that they had said, or that other folks had said that they're kind of banging the drum about Arithia being scary. That's probably what they're looking for. Yeah. But I, I don't like this infantry purchase that they've done. Yeah, they've been slamming these glaive dudes. Which yeah, are fine, I think that's especially if you can earth meld stuff. They kill things really quickly if it's earth melted. But I mean it's fine. It's it's not a it's not high tier late age infantry though. Yeah, I just don't think it's worth the gold. I think that like you want to be doing indie crossbows and like uh, at yeah. least until you're worried about arrow fend shield troops maybe at least you don't pay you a know premium that... for them like you used to in in middle age they're only 10 gold now thank god that's true they do have reduced stats though yeah the main thing is you things are going to need to be earth melded for these guys to really hit it but if you do they just they they one hit kill stuff yeah i i just don't love them for anyone that they're actually going to be fighting and i think that they should be spending their gold just doing forts and mages yeah i think so too let's see if we have any new forts going up oh he started building a fort on this throne so this is going to be two new forts for him so that's significant. yeah that's something that plus the infrastructure they got from midgard is definitely going to help yeah more my complaint was that he's he is spending this gold on stuff that i don't think is going to 
have that much of an impact. Okay. Well, we'll get to see that. Well, hopefully we get to see it. We don't... He might hang tight, but TNG really can't hang tight too long. He's he's really got to be a player. Yeah. It's a snowball nation. Right. They they just don't scale as well as other folks. So they want to hit that Evo 6 timing, get so, to the point where they can spam Wailing Winds the way that Pythium is currently spamming Foul Vapors and just fight on a very broad front. Yeah. Take lots of battles with their localized army superiority. And then once other folks get that same magic online or start getting their own counters to it, you really start losing steam. Yeah. Okay, so that's Tian Chi. We've covered the Agartha conflict. Udgard, pulling back, it looks like he's positioning to go kill these barbs who've been plaguing him to no end. I don't like this. Yeah, I don't like it but, either. I mean, yeah. We talked about this before, though, so yeah, we know that he like is... Yeah, this like XP farm. It's turn 27. You should easily be able to... You shouldn't be mobilizing your troops and having attrition to go fight barbs. You should just send a Scrotty in to get some experience. The mage core he's left on the Agartha front, which is kind of interesting. Oh, is that a devil in Arithia's southern territory? Arithia's southern territory. On the border with... Yeah, that's a devil. Huh. Huh. Uh, so that he has a soul contract. contract. Yeah. yeah. I, that's a fun event. I, yeah, I don't see any more, so maybe that's the first one. Yeah, I, I'm assuming it's the soul contract event. And that he has it on his on whatever mage is doing the site searching there, and he's just bringing his devils around with him. Speaking of Arethia, we missed his throne battles. So let's check that out. Summoning some fire elementals. That's a yeah, lot of fire elementals. He sees death mages. Yeah, but fire elementals are just kind of like the easy button answer to handling a throne with a bunch of death mages. Yep. Like he, he's just bringing basically expendable troops, and then he's trusting the elementals to do, to clear stuff out for him, so he doesn't need to like actually worry about gearing stuff up or right. any kind of fancy scripting. He has burned his um, own troops pretty well, though. Yeah, this is just the low effort solution. Yep. Not the most efficient, but you know he doesn't mind losing anything that lot that died there. I don't think. And the throne he gets is the throne of death. Now, do you claim that as Arethia? No. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. Either. Yeah, not at this size. If you're if you're a micro state and you need to like figure out a way to do something, then you know at that point you can claim it. Right. But not with this stack. Yeah. Or not with this empire size, I should say. Right. I agree. And he's also cracked Atlantis's cap, so we'll get to see the final battle of of Atlantis probably next turn. Oh, well, maybe not, because Atlantis still proudly owns this province, which got pinged by a, a Pythium Mount King. Yeah, but Pythium basically just needs to get a couple of water mages, and he can take that no problem. Yeah. He could potentially even take it with death mages, but it's a little more expensive because you need more of them. Right. What happened over here? Oh. Marignan trying to lay claim to their pond. I don't know why they didn't keep using that that hero. Yeah, that that was very weird to me as well, because he already knew that it could take underwater provinces. He's had to keep moving it around. Right. I can see why this turn he would recall it. Right. But he had like a good three turns where the hero wasn't taking underwater provinces. Yeah. We do see. So one interesting thing about Marignan is that they've got a lot of those blood mages. It's like if you look at his um, the, forts, like it's mostly the adepts. I don't believe those guys can sail. Wait, the adepts? The Gothic adepts. They're the cheap, the oh, uh, they get a random price. Interesting. Yeah. This gives them so a potentially I... a lot more options because the diabolists are the dirt cheap ones, and these guys yeah. you can, they don't have that much they can do. They're either summoning imps or they're jumping in communions to do fire magic, like elementals, because they actually can do a lot of elemental spam. But so the the adepts they don't have sailing though is is the thing I was saying because oh. they so they can't get from the far lake province to go support the main fight the far lake this oh this one yeah that one yeah the chart makers can oh, i suppose devil's here so, too. oh god no this is what i don't like i really really don't like doing soul contracts on marignan especially this early i feel like it's so greedy the advanced fancy dance nice. game it's what the marignan player did there too i just don't like it I feel like it's so greedy compared to lifelong protections. 
Oh, yeah. I, I love lifelong protection in general. You're never going to find me arguing against it. Yeah. Marignon at least gets a discount on the soul contracts, yeah. but I think they're still kind of a trap. It's a trap. It's like, because you could get, for the price of two soul contracts, you could get like what? Like seven or something lifelong protections? Something stupid? And seven lifelong protections is going to swing a fight so much more than like ten devils will from two, you know, five turns of soul contracts. So... You know what their discount is on LLP? Uh, it's the same for all of them. It's twenty percent. You can only have a twenty percent okay. discount, I think. Okay. So, but there's yeah, it's, so... it's normally forty, and then the the, the sole contract is what eighty or something. But I forget uh, the default. Let's see. I'll pause it and check. All right, so we're back. We went and checked real quick, and it's ninety slaves and five. Fire gems for a soul contract. Yeah, so, so for Marignon, it's 72 slaves for a soul contract and 32 slaves for a lifelong protection. And I don't know about you guys, but I think that 32 slaves for infinite imps is a bargain. Yeah. It, the amount of impact that you're going to have, especially like, okay, you've, you've made three soul contracts, let's say, and somebody decides to attack you. How much value are those soul contracts going to provide? Almost nothing. You're going to get eight devils. Right, or maybe you get twelve devils, assuming they're about they're attacking you right now. It's the greediest item in the whole game. You're basically saying, "Hey, I won't need all these slaves for like ten turns, at a minimum." It's a, yeah. I mean, it's a, the you, you you take in a nation that is not in a super strong position, and you're like, oh, "I'm going to sit here and hope nobody attacks me." <laughs> it's just it's not a safe bet. So we'll see, but maybe he can do some magic here. Yeah, and given that Marignon does have enough mages to actually manually summon devils once you get, like, some booster items, it's not even that much more efficient just because you can pretty easily spam out the actual devil units if that's what you want for whatever reason. Right. And also, devils are really not what you want to be fielding against an army that's this killy because they'll get gunned down. Like, it's going to be a lot better against fewer elites or something like that. The imps are actually what you want here. And not like some imps, but like hundreds of imps. Hundreds of imps will have a lot to say to all these slingers, especially when they're backed up by the, the might of your full army. Yeah. The only downside, though, is that those blood mages in the eastern fort can't get there. Right. These guys are trapped. So not much to do about that. But, you know, he might need them as pan counter raiding stuff. So... You know, against the satyrs, the small fire elementals would actually do a lot of work. Yeah, so I yeah. actually agree that he can answer raiding with just, like, mages and, like, a very small handful of troops pretty effectively. Yeah, I mean, these guys actually can do some kind of crazy shit when you actually don't care about them. Like, especially the Diabolists, right? But you could, I mean, even the Godiatic Adepts, I mean, because you can do Power of the Spheres and Hell Power, and then some of these guys can actually do Ill Earth Summoning as well. But you can yeah, also do little... fire elementals. That's actually what I was about to say, is that ill earth spam is something that most nations of the game actually straight up can't do, because blood earth is usually, like, in pretty small quantity. Right. But on nations that can do it, it's functionally elemental spam that you don't need to pay real gems for. Right. And that's very powerful. The downside of the high fatigue cost is very easily offset by the fact that you're using a Sabbath to set it up anyways. So as long as you don't mind losing those slaves or have some sort of way of doing a turbo communion via whatever sustain options you can find. In Marignon's case, you kind of do have to sacrifice slaves to do it, so you're not going to be able to spam it quite as hard as some other nations can. Like, potentially a nation like a guard that manages to find Earth and empower some blood, or right. basically other Turbocom setups like what Pythium or Vettiheim can do this game. But yeah, with what Marignon has, it's going to be somewhat limited, but still extremely powerful just because elemental spam is such a fight-winning tactic in general. And being able to do it more consistently because you're using your slaves to pay for it is very strong. Yeah, and if you're if you're willing to to really expend the mages, doing health power is really strong. And I mean, you can make a ton of fire elementals and do summon health power, and then the enemy's going to have to fight the the fire elementals, and then they're going to have to fight all the horrors. So I mean, there's a lot of ways to use these mages and get a lot of value out of them. But you don't have to do that. Obviously, you can just do, you know, 
normal Sabbath communions and be pretty efficient. Yeah, I've always been a little underwhelmed with hell power bombs. Yeah, well, it's I've less of a bomb. More. It's more of actually yeah. you because you get two paths and reinvigoration. So yeah, I like hell power as the actual buff spell on like a Hinnom super combatants, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, I love but that. I, yeah, I, I don't think that uh, like I've seen people try to make bombs work, and I tried to make bombs work as. Which, right. you know, it's very easy to get a ton of cheap communion slaves, but it, it's just not that great compared to, like, I don't know, Wailing Winds. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not amazing. There are ways, like, I've got a... There's ways, too, you can kind of abuse returning and do them where you don't actually lose a ton of the mages. And it is something Marignan can do reasonably well, you know. They have a they have enough sure. blood astral that they can kind of swing it, but... Anyway... This is us speculating on things they might do. What is more interesting is what they're actually going to do. And that we won't know until next turn, where the battle orders will be issued. Yeah, it definitely looks like they're they're going to face some trouble, though, because that Pangea stack is very scary. Yeah, and it's never fun when the first thing that Sai and I are saying is, you should sacrifice forts. <laughs> That's just like a not how you want to start any war off ever. Sacrifice yeah, but I don't see how he's. I don't see how he holds that southern yeah, court. Yeah. I think that's a goner. Yeah, I think it's a goner too. I mean, that's if he has it. Arrowfind, I think... he has things he can do potentially. I don't think he does though. Yeah, I think part of the issue though is that he's not like by any means out. I think he actually definitely can wipe either of those two armies if he has like enough gems and can get his mage balls in the right place at the right time for these battles but it's going to be very hard for him to actually take the initiative right well the thing is is by like even like killing this army is likely going to put it out i mean he's going to lose two forts they the only way to lose to to keep these two forts is to sacrifice these two basically so Unless he can divide yeah, and, and conquer, which it, that may be possible. Like maybe he can move enough stuff from the capital here and have an epic defense and like protect both of these. Maybe it's pop. Maybe he, if he moves every single mage he has, it's possible. I, I don't know. I don't think it is, but I don't want to say it's completely impossible. Yeah. The only way that I could see that working is if he somehow gets all of Penn's army at once and just dumps air elementals on it. Well, I mean, the, we, don't, we don't actually have a very predictable move from Gath, but we have a very predictable move from Pangea. This army is going on top of this fort. There is no two ways about it. So, uh, Well, we also know that Pan was pretty careful when he was fighting Miklin. I agree that that's like the, the very transparent move, but given that Pangea assuredly has scouting, he can see that there's a ton of crossbows in Marignan's capital, which are in range of that fort. So he might be, like, scared to take a fight without actually seeing what's going to be there. Yeah, that's possible. He might do a raid. but And maybe he could do a raid that would be big enough to gym bait air elementals. But I think that's if you're Marignan, do, you do consider... Like, I would say if this is the same army plus a little bit of extra stuff that fought and killed Miklin, and that comes here, do I have a stack? That's like, if I moved everything here, could I take it? I'd probably go ahead and deploy it. That's one of the things when you're on a defensive thing, you're like, oh no, I'll, I'll reveal what I'm doing or I'll get gym burned. Okay, fine. You know, you have to take, like, you can't just bend over and let him move this army on top of it and lose the initiative. Yeah, I think as Pan, I do pretty much what you just said, where you send an army that's large enough to beat the Fort PD and would bait gems if he does actually do a full defense that way you basically get intel and you don't lose momentum so yeah if he doesn't do a full defense if he you know leaves like a small trap or something of yeah. his own then you take the province and that's awesome and then you can move on to it with confidence next turn knowing that he's either going to have stuff stuck inside the fort or that he's already moved out of it and that that's free for you to take yeah meanwhile if he does move his army in, you basically just paid a handful of units for great intel and potentially burn gems so it's, it's kind of a win-win and you can still keep your army in motion by moving it into that forest next to your throne. Forest next to your throne. Oh, this one. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, yeah. actually, the pan army should move. If you do that move, I would move the pan army here. That way I fork these two forts. Yeah, either way works fine. Yeah. The reason that I, I would like to move to the forest is basically to prevent yourself from losing that throne. Yeah. In case Marignan just decides to ride out and be a silly boy. Yeah. 
I guess you don't mind losing that throne too much. Yeah, I wouldn't because be worried you can pick about it back that. Later. And it's the throne of misfortune, so it's not like you're claiming it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, I think the right play from Marignan, I don't think you sit around and wait. I think you have to be aggressive. If you can take this fight, you try to take it. That opens you up to pan Jim baiting you, scouting you, all the things. But what are you going to do? I honestly think that you take the fight against Gas just because it's easier. Yeah. So you kill that army and then like lose some stuff to Pangea and then swing back around and fight Pangea later, hopefully with more allies while you cry about like... Yeah, you know, losing land to the big scary Pangea while you're killing Gas Army. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think so too. That's probably, but I think it depends. Like, if I were playing the position, I would be testing whether I think I could win it or not. If I could win both, I would de I would choose to do it. If I thought I could only win one, then I would just choose to win that one. But it, there's a lot of things we don't know exactly how many mages, what his research is, so. We see a ping on the Gath army there, though, right? But it, it was a patrol, so it wasn't a ping. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, and that's not the full army. Yeah. Never you mind, then. I'm also less scared of Gath's mage support, because right. you know that his research core are those sages, so it's going to be a relatively predictable number of mages. It's basically the mages that you've seen before, right. um, and now see with the army. The only additions that he has now are those crystal mages. Yeah. But, you know, we haven't seen Marignan tested. We're going to finally get to see it. And that's going to reveal exactly what kind of player we're dealing with. Because he's been kind of passive so far. But I want to see him bring, you know, see what he can bring. Is he going to bring he's out all the big guns? Passive. Or what, is he going to roll over yeah. and die? Let's find out. I think he has enough juice, like just enough units and mages deployed, that there's no way he just rolls over and dies. It's just a matter of, like, how effective he's going to use the tools that he has. Well, sure. I mean, when I say roll over and die, I don't mean literally like topple the king. I mean, is he going to marshal all the troops and all the mages and fight at the same time with them all loaded up with gems to cast important shit, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Okay, let's take a look. Betty, time, any, any further movement here? Scouts being patrolled out, catching the blood hunting operations. Ooh, he's got a lumber construct. Powerful. Very strong. <laughs> Don't see anything else. Yeah, no, he, he's clearly just... He's yeah. continuing to play SimCity, I should say. Right. That's been his stated goal, and he's progressing very well along. Ulm is sieged. Oh, Joman has taken this province back from Arco, so that's kind of cool. And is continuing to ping this, but not doing anything. Wait, what, did we already cover them? Maybe we already covered them, because either these guys stayed still... No, they stayed still. They stayed still. Okay. Because we saw that we actually saw that army composition last turn because it got pinged or patrolled something out. Whereas we don't see the battle, the cross swords on that province this turn. And he's so got yeah, the he moved the ghost king in there still. The ghost king was in there last turn, so presumably he's just sitting here researching. Oh, there's also a well of pestilence here, so that's probably why he doesn't want to move this army here to to just camp out. He only wants to move it to kick people off. That makes sense. The only problem, though, is that then he's got his army separated from his mages. Yeah, depending how many mages are here. I think most of the mages might come from the capital, or who knows? Well, yeah, he doesn't have a lab in that farm, so he can't keep all of his mages with his army. Oh, so. yeah. So you mean he could, like, push into him, and if the mages went here, they would, like, miss each other. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Arco wins the push, though, because Jillman's troops have really high stats. Yeah. Okay. And Arco doesn't have, like, quantity of troops, I don't think, to win. Yeah. He could summon a bunch of stuff in order to win a bump, but I don't know if a lot of people know how to exploit those mechanics. Right. Yeah, I certainly like that, don't. That, they're, they're very weird mechanics. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's it for this episode. Yeah, seems like. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thanks for hosting. And viewers, as always, thank you for tuning in. And if you made it to the end, thank you for sticking with us. And we will see you next time on turn 28, which for Sai and I is actually the current turn. So finally be live. See you then.